Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is lovely to see you all here and thank you for choosing fascism over football um, <laughs> for a short time. Uh, Secretary Albright, this is genuinely a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity because never again will you see England basked in endless sun and England fans relaxed about a football game. It just won't happen again. It's almost unsettling and we must enjoy it. It is a huge pleasure to welcome Secretary Albright here this evening. Anyone who's read the news recently will see we've arranged a whole sequence of world events just to make her book tour even more pertinent. And yeah. it is called Fascism, A Warning, uh, which takes you to where we're going to be tonight. Uh, Primo Levi, quoted in the book, said, every age has its fascism. He, of course, survived and wrote of the Holocaust. And it's that period, I guess, 1930s Europe, that has come to own the mantle of fascism. For many of us, it feels slightly fixed, doesn't it, in that historic time and place. But the echo of Levy's words, through Albright, have rarely been more keenly felt. Fascism no longer feels like some abstract concern, a history lesson for the kids, an anachronism. We find fascism finding its feet all over the world now in 2018. And it is a truly extraordinary thing to have with us Secretary of State Madden Albright because she is both author and player. She documents the seismic events of the 20th and the 21st century and often recounts her own role within them. So I hope we're going to explore some of that this evening. Meetings with Serbian dictator Slobodan Milosevic, North Korea's dictator Kim Jong-il, with Vladimir Putin, with Venezuela's Hugo Chavez, the daughter of Czech refugees herself. She arrived in America with the goal of being a typical gum-chewing teenager. And she writes of what it feels to be the outsider, first of all, as well as the consummate insider advising President Bill Clinton on his foreign policy. She was also a vocal campaigner, as many of you will remember, for Hillary Clinton in the 2016 election, which was lost to Donald Trump. And we're going to have a conversation, which I think will take us uh, up to around 45, 50 minutes, and then we very much welcome your questions. Um, do join in, but the shorter the better, because we get more of you um, heard. So, a warm welcome, Secretary Albright. Thank you. thank you for being with us in London. And you open the book with this... Well, first, can I thank you very much, and also for telling everybody who I am, because not everybody <laughs> always knows. Not long ago, I was uh, coming back from China, and Chicago was the first port of entry, and I was there getting undressed for the security people. And I put my stuff on the conveyor belt, and the lady behind me said, so where'd you get all your screw-top bottles? My bottles all leak. I said, well, I got them at this container store. And then I start going towards the magnetometer, and the TSA guard looks at me, and he says, oh, my God, it's you. He said, <laughs> uh, said, I'm from Bosnia, and we all love you in Bosnia, and if it weren't for you, there wouldn't be a Bosnia, and you're welcome in Bosnia, and can I have my picture taken with you? So we do that. Line gets all screwed up. I go back to get my stuff, and the lady of the screw-top bottle says, so what exactly happened here? And I said, well, I used to be Secretary of State, and she said, of Bosnia? <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> I'm not sure how I followed that one, but if I make a, a similar sort of mistake, I know it will be retold in the next auditorium. Um, I'm going to start where you start, which is a discussion that you have with your students when you're teaching and you ask them to define fascism for you. And I'm interested to hear what you all landed on. Well, let me just say what is interesting. I teach at Georgetown and I teach a course. I say foreign policy is just trying to get some country to do what you want. That's all <laughs> it is. What are the tools? So my course is called the National Security Toolbox. And I teach graduate students in the fall and undergrads in the spring. And my graduate students, both actually, um, ha it's a very mixed international group um, and people that are very committed to foreign policy and political science. And I think that their discussion was that they began to see 
how fascism comes about as a result of dislocations in society and somebody kind of trying to give answers that are simple and direct mm -hmm. in terms of dealing with very complicated problems. The thing that was interesting was that we kind of also talked about whether they thought fascism was possible in the United States, and they did think so. And so um, it was interesting to kind of see what that generation was thinking about, how they saw things. Um, and I, I actually really love spending time with my students. It's not easy to teach these days, um, and especially um, when you're teaching a course that has to do with decision making. And so I try very hard not to brainwash my students. And so I say the U.S. is a fairly old country and we've made decisions before and it's up to them to judge the decision making process through the toolbox. And when you're looking to define fascism, do you think of it as an ideology or a movement? Does it have to include violence? What are your your staples? Well, first of all, I do think fascism is a term that's being thrown around. Uh, whenever anybody disagrees with you, they're a fascist. Um, and then if uh, the teenage boy wants to drive the car and the father says, no, he's a fascist. And so there's really, it's just kind of a loose uh, term. And I did do work hard in the book to define it. It is not an ideology. I mean, communism is an ideology. It's based on a lot of writings that have to do with that and, and a uh, an explanation of an ideology. I think fascism is a tool. It is a method for getting power and exercising it over people. I do think that one way to define a fascist leader is somebody who identifies himself with a national group, a tribal large group, uh, in order to exclude those that are not part of it out of it and take away their rights and ultimately a real fascist leader uses violence, a bully with an army. But it's basically this identification of, and, uh, and a real uh, uh, pushing uh, the distinctions between one group and another. And you call the book Fascism a Warning because you want to set off uh, alarm bells. Which countries do you feel are in the grip of a new fascism in 2018? Well, unfortunately, more than um, I had thought, frankly. When I wrote the book, I, I was writing about uh, Hungary, which I know very well, and, um, and the part that happened, the, what Orban has been doing. I write about Poland because I'm very surprised at some of the things that have happened there in terms of uh, pushing a very highly nationalist kind of uh, uh, discussion. Turkey, Turkey just proved it last Sunday um, with another re-election of Erdogan. Um, I think that Venezuela, uh, Philippines, is what I write about. I am concerned about what is happening in Italy, uh, and I think that one has to keep watching. And I think that the issue is what is happening in those countries and why is it appealing to people to um, exacerbate the divisions and then um, really have a centralization of authority, have no respect for democratic institutions or the freedom of the press. You wouldn't, at this point, call any of those countries fascist? No, I would not. The only one I actually call fascist is North Korea. And does there have to be an element, you talk of nationalism, of racism? Is that an important element in the movement itself? Well, I think part of what's going on, and just to, um, with a little bit more depth here, the question is why are there divisions in society now? And by the way, I was going to write this book no matter who won, uh, because I could see divisions taking place between the haves and have-nots, partially because the social contract has broken down. Uh, people join a society, give up some individual rights in order to have the government do certain things for them, and both sides had kind of let down the other. And so I was concerned about the divisions. I think that the, the aspect of it that um, really got me on this is that uh, what it is, as I mentioned, um, the identification with a tribal group, frankly. And one of the things that I think I've talked about is that there's a mega trend, which is globalization, and a lot of people have benefited from it, but it has a downside. It's faceless. And so people actually want an identity, which is fine. We all want to know our linguistic, ethnic, religious identity. But if my identity hates your identity, patriotism turns into 
nationalism and hypernationalism, and that's very dangerous. So one of the, to just put the pieces together, the leader identifies with normally some national group at the exclusion of the other and then has to blame somebody for why the economy or whatever is not good and it creates the scapegoat mm. which then leads to racism. You will know very well though that there is a clever use of language when you talk to people like, um, I've interviewed Marine Le Pen in the past and Hungarian uh, cabinet members recently and they will describe what they are doing as a protection measure, as a way of helping their country, as a way of helping the people that have been left behind. And if you ever call them out on racism, there'll be a frank denial. There'll be a, you know, don't criticize my country, don't call me xenophobic. Now, do, do you think we have not been sharp enough at calling that out? Or do you think that we do have to take this sense of n nationalism slightly more seriously now because it has been getting lost. Well, I think part of what's happening, again, so many definitional aspects. I believe in patriotism. I think, you know, we're, we're being dedicated to your country. However, if you decide that anybody that is not exactly like you is a threat, so that what you're seeing, for instance, in Hungary, deciding that uh, anybody that is not a Hungarian is a threat, um, and um, then, you know, Putin talks about religion. Um, in Poland, there is a little bit more also uh, a, an aspect of looking to Christians. Um, and so it becomes something that is exclusionary, and not only exclusionary, but blaming that minority for something that is wrong. So uh, there are various degrees of it. But um, partially, that is one of the issues of this identification with one group at the expense of another. I want to bring us back to Europe and ultimately, of course, to Donald Trump. But before we get there, um, you spend a lot of time in the book talking about the 1930s, what I said is the, the sort of the rump of, of fascism in Europe. And I wonder when you describe Hitler, Mussolini, Franco, if you see a characteristic emerging, we know that the leaders uh, met several times. Is there something that binds these men in what has made them successful as fascists? Well, I think what is interesting, by the way, my book really has a lot of history in it, and I learned an awful lot as mm -hmm. I was doing research for it. Um, Mussolini was um, quite a character. I mean, he switched from being a socialist to moving to the right and trying to, by the way, he said, drain the swamp in Italian. Um, and, uh, and what he really wanted to do was um, acquire personal power, a very dramatic kind of person, uh, an outsider that then became an insider. In a similar way, Hitler was an outsider. He had failed on a number of different aspects. Here, he also kept talking about the Aryan race, and he was a short guy with black hair and a mustache. So, uh, you know, there, there are a bunch of different aspects to it, but mostly, uh, and Franco was just this pudgy little colonel, uh, but basically <laughs> what they did was persuade people that they had an answer and that everything that they said and did was right. So was it a linguistic uh, tack then? I mean, you said Hitler was a genius at reading a crowd and being able to reduce big issues to simple things. So he'd say there are only two possibilities, Aryans or Jews. He would give people choices. Do you think that is instrumental? There is very much so, because the truth is that nobody I know from when I've gone out to help in campaigns, if you say it's complicated, then people's eyes glaze over and, you know, I'm not here to listen to you tell me it's complicated, solve it. Um, and so I do think that there is that appeal of slogans and of having simple answers. And then uh, one of the other aspects of fascism is knowing how to play with a crowd uh, and feeding off of it in a way and being able to read what they need and then providing simple slogans. I don't want to get away from the history, but that's such an interesting point. Do you think then that um, whatever you would see as the antidote to fascism, to democracies and, and, and liberalism, can ever present those issues in such stark, simplistic terms? Well, it... it 
you ask in a, a very complicated thing because it would be better if we could, but we can't. Because I really do think that it takes a certain knowledge of what, where the society is. I, but, and this is the real problem, is how to have a discussion with people that actually want simple answers and not be condescending. Um, and, and I think that the issue is how to bring people along in the discussion um, and not kind of either say it's too complicated for you all uh, or, ha or bring it down to, two, to slogans. But democracy is not easy. We know that. Mm. Dictatorship is easy. So let's go back to the 1930s then. There was a machismo, perhaps. Lee. Um, do, I mean, do you think there has ever been a fascist female leader? Because it seems when you're describing Mussolini, um, Hitler, Franco, you know, they, they weren't physically charismatic, right? Well, the only one that is Evita Perón, right. um, you know, had a, a, an attractiveness and I think um, was able to mesmerize people. But there's certainly are no match. I mean, um, I, I don't think that there were many female leaders. I've tried to think about it because I just automatically say he. And I, in fact, have said all of them are he's. And then I began to look. But Evita Perón, I think, is the only one. And Hitler and Mussolini met. What did they think of each other? Well, it, I just really try to visualize this, frankly, whether they had a bromance or not. Uh, and, um, and I think that um, Mussolini was older than Hitler and clearly was the person that invented fascism. Um, and I think that from what I could uh, glean from uh, research is there was initial admiration uh, of Hitler, by Hitler of Mussolini. But then I think that Hitler kind of saw Mussolini a little bit more, that he was more clown-like, less disciplined than Hitler was. Um, and Hitler also pushed fascism into Nazism, uh, which really, uh, Mussolini did not have that same racial aspect to it. And um, I find this, in my own reaction, I found Mussolini really interesting to do research about. But one thing that absolutely stunned me was you describe Hitler as quite lazy and Mussolini as the one who's work driven. Well, what happened, Mussolini was an outsider and he really did study a lot and read a lot. Um, and then he really was somebody that had a lot of different ideas. And Hitler, I think, just kind of demanded, Hitler surrounded himself with many more military people. Um, he had kind of armed guards and, and um, was more, um, just said, this is what I want, this is how it's gonna happen. And the s sense I got was that it was not something that was intellectually based, although he did write Mein Kampf. Uh, but I do think that it was not um, of the same. But it's very hard. I, I keep trying to visualize what it was really like, whether they shook hands, um, you know. Do you think they liked each other? I, it's hard to tell. I mm. think that there was obviously some admiration, some jealousy, some copycatting um, in terms of uniforms and salutes and things like that. Mm. And so, uh, but it's, it's interesting to kind of visualize. And what was going on in Europe at that time, of course, completely affected your own life. You left your native Czechoslovakia, traveled by boat uh, eventually to England, and I think what you describe as a, a dingy boarding house not far from here in Notting Hill. Um, do you have those memories of the I do. Of the I mean, when, what happened was, um, I was born in 1937, and uh, the Nazis marched into Czechoslovakia in 39, and we made our way out. So when I got here, I was about two, so I don't remember, uh, obviously, the early part. What I do remember afterwards, after the dingy um, house, we then did live in a nice kind of uh, set of apartments in Notting Hill Gate before it got fancy. It kind of backed up on Portobello Road. Um, but the bottom line that I do remember was the Blitz and every night going down to the cellars uh, to sleep with uh, everybody in the, apart in the apartment building and then getting up in the morning and seeing buildings destroyed. And then we moved out uh, after the Blitz to Walton-on-Thames in Surrey and um, had one of those, they were called Morrison tables, which were uh, big metal tables that we were told that if your house was hit by a bomb and you were under the table, you would survive. So um, we uh, ate on the table, I played around the table, we slept under the table. And I spent a lot of time in air raid shelters singing 100 green bottles hanging on the wall. And then you left uh, Walden-on-Thames, went back to Czechoslovakia. It was 
then the communists that came in, and that, that time right. it took you to America. Where what happened was my father uh, became ambassador to Yugoslavia um, after we were in Prague for a while, and then we went to Belgrade. The little girl in the national costume that gives flowers at the airport, that's what I did for a living. Uh, and uh, I had, my father didn't want me going to school with communists, so I had a governess and very isolated kind mm -hmm. of life. My father was a professional diplomat, and so his time was up after three years, and he got another job, which was to represent Czechoslovakia on a new commission at the UN on India and Pakistan to deal with Kashmir. And then the coup happened in February 48, and he didn't want to work for the communists. And so his best friends in Belgrade were the British and American ambassadors, and they said, your country's just had a coup, and if you uh, resign, they'll name some communist, and we won't get anything done. So keep the job and report to us, which is what he did. Um, and we uh, went, came to America in November 48. My father came a little later. He defected and asked for political asylum. When I uh, became, uh, when I was in office, the State Department gave me the letter that he wrote begging for oh. asylum. So extraordinary. They saved that all it, that time. And right, I mean, really incredible. And then my, at that stage, the Rockefeller Foundation was finding jobs for Central European intellectuals, and they found my job, my father, a job in Denver, and we had no idea where Denver was. Um, but um, I did grow up as I did, as you pointed out. I just wanted to be a plain old American, and I had these very ethnic parents. Uh, my mother, we had a lot of Czech food, and my mother was a delightful nut who liked to read palms at dinner parties. Oh, uh, oh and, I'm feeling your yeah, pain. Yeah, and, yeah, <laughs> and she would sit next to some man while his wife was on the other side and say, you were going to have many affairs. Uh, 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 and, and then she predicted that I would have three sons, and I have three daughters, so all in all. And then my father wanted to fit in in Colorado, which meant fishing. The only problem was that he fished in a coat and tie. I mean, I lived a total life of embarrassment all the time. And America to you then was what? This sort of land of, of plenty and dream and everything, was it? Well, it, in many ways, it was fantastic, I have to say, though we were refugees um, and um, lived in, in kind of, a, a faculty housing that wasn't very big, and I went to school, high school on a scholarship, and then to college on a scholarship. And, um, and but this was a middle class. The United States was a middle class country, and people were very welcoming, um, and um, and wanted to know more about our background and you know coming from Czechoslovakia. Um, and I was just grateful. I mean, if anybody asks me just flat out, who am I? I'm a grateful American for having been accepted. You paint a picture of, of being, if you like, the odd one out, whereas the sense we all get is America was, was coming together at that stage full of people just like you. But everybody, it was very different because it was into melting pot time, mm. whereas later, um, a lot there, it became more of a mosaic where people spent much more time kind of talking about their background. Um, and um, some of it came with the civil rights movement, but there really was this kind of thing, melting pot. And by the way, when I got to, um, when we first came to the United States, it was in November, and Thanksgiving came up right after, and there's this American hymn, We Gather Together, and all of a sudden I heard somebody asking for God's blessing, and I thought, who's asking? And then I realized I was the one asking, mm -hmm. and from then on I asked. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you decide, you also say it's very important not to over-romanticize the, the blue sky innocence of America. Were you aware then of a darker side of racial divides, of civil rights abuses in the country? Um, I, I wasn't, frankly, and I hadn't actually... Uh, Denver was uh, basically a white city with some uh, Latinos there, but I hadn't met a black person until I went to college. Um, and then there was only one black girl in our class. And, and it was only after we moved to Washington, which is a black city, um, that one was aware of a lot of the, the, those discussions and went to Washington in 1968 and a lot of the, the riots that were going on. But I think that one got the sense 
that um, more and more as I uh, was out on my own and, and saw the divisions that were in society, one of the big shocks to me, uh, when my husband was in the army, we were in Missouri, and that was the first time that I kind of saw signs that said whites only. Um, and bathrooms were segregated and a number of different things. So Denver was a very different kind of a place, and slowly but surely it became evident, especially during the Civil Rights Movement, that mm. things were... I think the hard part for many people to accept, and it was for me, um, is that, that there was a poor class in America um, in, in many ways, and that there were huge divisions because it all looked very different. And partially, I think the other part when we came, my father, um, uh, in Europe, or, or in continental Europe, there really was a division between the intelligentsia and other people, and the intelligentsia, which would be college students, would never work. Um, they would, and what happened, I remember my father coming back and saying, can't believe it, one of my students was waiting on tables. Um, and others were putting gas in cars um, when people used to do that. And the bottom line is that that surprised him, that college students would be mm. workers. So when we slowly but surely kind of saw a different um, atmosphere. And I'm going to bring you up to now to the 1950s, and you've got the sort of the beginning of the threat of the Cold War, the Soviet. You've got McCarthyism in your own country. Did, did McCarthy seem to you to have fascist tendencies, or was he, did he convince America at that time he was protecting the nation? Uh, both, frankly, and that's part of the problem, because there was this fear of communism. And by the way, to put my story back into that, it took us a long time to get our citizenship, because as I told you, there was a time that t theoretically my father was working for communists, because he had not mm. resigned. Um, and so during trying to get our citizenship during the McCarthy era, when there was this kind of red hunt under every rug, um, there you could feel it. But he did, there was, the Cold War, I think, was viewed as a very serious threat to America. And so therefore, it was kind of the protective part, but at the same time, um, fascist tendencies very much. Did you believe that McCarthy was uh, genuine in what he Felt. No, I don't, because I think that he was looking for something to kind of um, show his power. Um, and one of the things that I found, much to my dismay, was that um, a Jesuit a priest that, uh, at Georgetown suggested that maybe going after communists was not a bad way to go about it. So it was suggested to him. Well, yeah, there were suggestions. That I found some conversations in which he was trying to figure out what his... Um, tool Thing was going to be, what, what, the, what the path was going to be. And years later, of course, you would be the most senior US diplomat sitting opposite Vladimir Putin, an ex-KGB spy. Um, when you sat down as an adult and critically of US Secretary of State, what was your sense from Putin then? Well, first of all, I used to be a Soviet expert. And so I spent a lot of time studying the Soviet Union, and I speak Russian, and um, I had spent time, what was a, the most incredible time to be um, at the UN and Secretary of State was at the end of the Cold War. And one of the things uh, that when we expanded NATO, um, I went to see Yeltsin about that, and um, he was very different kind of a character, and I was trying to explain what we were doing, and he would say, um, Stop translating, she speaks Russian. And, and by the way, what is interesting, one of the more interesting things that I did was go to a Helsinki summit between Clinton and Yeltsin and visualizing, uh, visualizing now a Trump-Putin mm. summit in the same place uh, yeah. uh, will be. But anyway, what happened is the first time... Uh, we'll I'd, get there, yeah. don't worry, we'll get there. The first time I met Putin was when we were at an APEC meeting in New Zealand when President Clinton and Putin was just beginning kind of an acting in his role and he seemed very kind of small and reptilian and uh, <laughs> wanted to uh, ingratiate himself with everybody. Then what happened was that um, I uh, had to go to Moscow to help prepare for the summit that we were having in 2000. And it was very clear to me that he was tough and very smart. 
And what was interesting about him when Clinton came was that um, Putin didn't have any talking points and notes, and he took notes. And you could tell that he was very engaged and very smart and tough. The other part that kind of showed some uh, characteristics, um, believe it or not, they actually did a jazz concert for uh, President Clinton. And President Clinton played the saxophone and loved to have people. And so Clinton could never sit still when there was music. He'd always be jiving mm -hmm. around. Putin sat there like this yeah. through the whole thing. And I think he's very tough. I think that he has played a weak hand very well and that he is definitely an ex-KGB agent. There is a story that um, w many of us will remember of Angela Merkel going to see him for the first time and him saying, what are you scared of? And she confides in him, why would you? Dogs. And so the next time they Putin meet, has he dog. has huge dogs yeah, in the room yeah. to intimidate her. I'm wondering if you felt um, read by him or if you felt he was in some way trying to control you in the direction of... Well, I think, um, I have to say, I didn't spend that much time with him by myself. But, and he was at the kind of beginning of his time. I think that he is somebody, by the way, I've done a lot of reading about him and the background that he comes from and why he decided that he'd wanted to go into the KGB very early. Um, and his relation, you know, concerned about um, how his family had been treated and a very interesting character. And then there's a new book called The New Czar about how he, how he mm -hmm. got, what I found very interesting about him is that he had been an assistant to somebody that we considered um, a kind of a, a liberal mayor in what was still Leningrad at the time. Um, and all of a sudden he was somebody according to these books, is who was a very good assistant and was very thorough and did his job and was trusted by the people that he worked for, which is why I think Yeltsin gave him the power that he had. And then he developed his own um, machismo um, approach um, and the judo and all kinds of things that he does to prove that he's taller than he is. Do, 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 you, um, do you think, do you reckon that you could still do business with him today? Do you think he is essentially the same man or? No, I, I think that, by the way, in 91, I did a survey of all of Europe after the fall of the wall. And it was a very thorough professional work with people that really knew how to do those kind of attitude survey. And we had a lot of questionnaires and things, but we also had a focus groups. And one I will never forget was uh, one that we did outside of Moscow. And this man stands up and says, I'm so embarrassed. We used to be a superpower, and now we're Bangladesh with missiles. And what has happened is Putin has managed to identify himself for that kind of a man as somebody that is going to put Russia back on the map and the greatness of Russia. Um, and in order to do that, he has in many ways kind of changed, I think, what he's believed in because all of a sudden the church is very important to him and uh, Russian history. And what he has done is used the tools that he learned in his previous job as a KGB person in terms of weaponizing information. Um, and he, I think he has organized and his goal is to separate us from our allies. Uh, and Do you believe that he has been instrumental in creating divides in the EU? Yes, absolutely. Directly influencing elections or in what he said? Well, I think partially because they really, he is, there's nobody that's better at propaganda than communist KGB people. And what he's managed to, and by the way, one of the things, just in terms of characteristics of uh, Hitler and Mussolini and all the other people that I talk about that are, um, I don't say are fascists, but they do know how to use the media, and social media has improved, made it much easier. So I do think the Russians have been operating on uh, false, on, they came up with the fake news thing, uh, radio, uh, RT. Russia but would you today. go further than that? Do you actually believe that there has been interference in elections? Something, well, things that I have read uh, indicate that there has been, and I think that one of the things that is troubling is that we're not following that up as far as the United States is concerned, and we're about to have elections, and that is the part. There were questions today, as I was look, watching TV, and they said that there was going to be a summit 
Um, apparently, according to Bolton, the president was going to raise whether there was meddling. According to something coming out of the White House, the president said there wasn't meddling. So we'll have to see uh, what comes on that. Do you think that the EU is looking as if it's splitting now? I mean, you mentioned um, Orban, you mentioned Poland, you could throw in Slovenia with that, certainly Salvini now in Italy in terms of a unified approach to immigration, which is very different to that embraced by Merkel and by Macron. Do you think we are going to see Europe going different ways? Well, I think one of the things, there's no question that the concept of the European Union um, was something to try to mitigate what had led to World War II, the nationalism. Uh, and I think that um, it's a, obviously a very complex system and are they the faceless bureaucrats in uh, Brussels while there are nationalist feelings that are developing all over. I do think also that um, it, there has been some uh, misperception and misunderstanding of what really happened in Central and Eastern Europe after the fall of the wall. I was among the people that was, uh, quote, euphoric about the changes. And, that, and part of that attitude survey that I did then showed that they all wanted to be Europeans. And then all of a sudden, some of the nationalist tendencies um, came out. And they're really, um, we could spend hours just in talking about this, but I do think that there is a division in Europe. I do think that the Central and East Europeans feel that they are treated as second-class citizens within the system. There now are differences on immigration. Mm. Then there are the issues to do with that the EU makes decisions by consensus, and the Poles and the Hungarians have each other's back. In right, this. and I want to talk specifically about that question of, of immigration. Um, Angela Merkel's fighting for her political life. Um, I wonder if you ever think, what if Hungary and Italy and the rest are actually right? What if she made the wrong call in 2014, 2015, in terms of letting in the million immigrants? Well, I happen to think she was right, but I think the real problem was the following. First of all, that there was not any foresight about the fact that there would be um, refugees that were coming out of the Middle East that were where the whole Middle East was falling apart and um, that in fact for instance Jordan that is a front line state um, has uh, refugee camps of people coming out of Syria um, and so I have held a number of different conferences and meetings about why Europe was not prepared for any of this. The EU, at a certain stage, I, we had a meeting and people were talking about the fact that they didn't have the computer capability to even begin to process people. So people arrive in Greece and, and islands and, they, and the system broke down. And yet I do think that um, for the most part people have um, humanitarian feelings when they see people that have escaped in boats, etc. Um, and so I, th I happen to think she did the right thing. I think the but problem there a, is... There was a recklessness, though, wasn't there, in some way, that it felt like, and we understand in its historical context um, just how important it must have been for a German leader to offer that kind of asylum. But you will hear voices now saying, without the Merkel policy without those pictures of the influx of refugees in their numbers, you might not have got the Brexit vote in Britain, you might not have got the hardline policies in Italy, in Hungary, that actually that was a big turning point that drove a split in the, in the Union. Well, I think that, um, first of all, I think that there are any number of uh, national reasons in terms of why people had different views. Um, I think that they're also, um, and you'll have to forgive me because I go from one conference to another, where I, we were just talking about the fact that some of the pictures were fake, uh, rapes and things like that. So um, I think that... But the numbers weren't. The were numbers they? weren't. But the truth of the matter is, again, um, they're, the way I have seen things, um, the population in Germany is aging. They have needed to have... 
Um, I mean, I was just in Berlin. There are an awful lot of Turkish businesses there. Um, and, and I think that probably in, I mean, it, one of the things that I've learned is that uh, making judgments about how people make decisions at the time based on the information that they have is unfair. Right. Um, ex post facto kind of uh, uh, rulings about this. I think that there probably should have been more of an EU approach to it. Um, and I'm sure that she wishes that there were. I do think that um, if there had been some kind of discussion about who took whom, but it was an emergency. Mm. Um, and for the most part, I mean, in uh, the Western Hemisphere, the Canadians took people, we haven't. And what I find really hard to do as an American at this point is for me to have any critical word to say about how the refugee situation has been dealt with in Europe when we are being totally un-American on it. You have um, brought me to Trump, um, and I'm <laughs> <laughs> guessing that's where a lot of our questions will come from, so let me just kick off with uh, a few thoughts. You've said he's no fascist, but he's the least democratic American president you've seen. Do you understand why no one around him from within his party or within what we would call the civil service or any advisor can point out to him the importance of America's institutions? Well, first of all, let me just say this because uh, it is not easy given somebody that was a former diplomat and be in a foreign country and criticize the president. But I do think that I have found it passing strange that it is so difficult uh, for anybody that has spent their life living in the United States to be so uh, derogatory of our institutional systems. And the thing that bothers me, and the reason that I say he's the most undemocratic president is because um, there is a lack of understanding of the importance of freedom of the press um, and of our institutional structures. Um, and even though he's now gonna have an opportunity to even change the Supreme Court more, there really has been a lack of respect for the judiciary um, and um, a kind of a, a way of uh, making it very difficult for the system to function. I don't know, I, I try to visualize, having served in, I worked for President Carter and for President Clinton, I've been into the Oval Office, there is something unbelievable about being in such a historical place and you're there and you are even if you're Secretary of State, you walk in, there's the President of the United States sitting there, and you're trying to explain something to him. Bill Clinton was unbelievably smart and read a lot, but when I briefed him, he would often be doing a crossword puzzle. And I, I would think, listen to me, I am older than you are. Uh, and you can't- Did you say that? No, I didn't. Uh, 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 but I kept talking. And what is interesting is he clearly heard everything and he was much better at the meetings with the foreign leader that arrived. But I can visualize, you said, isn't there anybody around mm -hmm. Trump that can, I can visualize it's not easy um, in that way. And so uh, I don't know how they're, part of the problem with my teaching a decision-making course I know how the decision-making is supposed to work, and I can't see how it does at this point. You talked about the need to uh, find underlying reasons for the rise of um, the strongmen. I spent 18 months on the campaign trail, and we fell over backwards to explain the economic arguments um, that brought Trump to power, the grievances and globalization and automation and the crash, which I suspect was the safe way um, to report that. But I now wonder if we spent too long talking about economics and not enough honesty talking about the history of racism that clearly was underlying in the country at the time. You have a history of, of civil rights abuses and white supremacy and all the rest of it. I know he's been called an enabler, but. Do you think that that was a mistake, not to actually call out the racism that well, was there? But the thing that was happening that I think people thought was such a joke that people didn't report on it was the accusations that uh, President Obama was not an American, um, that he didn't have a birth certificate. And 
um, that showed that he was an American and that he was a Muslim. And by the way, one of the things that uh, I can, I think many of you might have heard about the, I, there is this thing called the White House Correspondents' Dinner. Um, and um, it was, I, I was there, um, and what happened was that there's always theoretically supposed to be some comedy going on. Um, Trump was there. He was, uh, you know, he wasn't a candidate or anything at that point. And President Obama, actually, they flashed something that looked that was his birth certificate. So the bottom line is that issue, which seemed so crazy and such and a joke, uh, I think was the basis of a not so much underlying racism. And but, I'm, so but, but I'm going to bring you back. So I'm asking something much more direct. I think, which is, was it racism? that brought Trump to power? Because we, we didn't say that on the campaign trail. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure it was racism. I think there was, however, a general feeling by a group of people um, that they felt that they were the losers in all of this. People that had, in fact, been the backbone of America, white working men. Um, and many of them had lost their jobs. Um, some because of primarily technology, not because there were a bunch of foreigners that had come in and taken it. And I think, I have to say, I think none of us paid enough attention to uh, what had happened in terms of a group of people feeling that they had been left out. And, and the hard part, I said this a little bit earlier, and I was out campaigning in terms of how not to be condescending towards them, saying if you only understood how complicated this is. Mm. Uh, but I think that um, there was a missing piece to the campaign in that regard. In, in, to Hillary Clinton's Generally, campaign. just all in all. And, and I, let me just say this. I actually think that Donald Trump is very smart, uh, that he plugged into something that he saw, um, and I, I think that he turned it into um, his support in mm. many ways, but I think the mistake was made that um, people didn't think it could happen. He, uh, I think it was Thomas Friedman who, who put it this way, that, that Donald Trump had the first line, you know, whether it was make America great, drain the swamp. Uh, and Hillary Clinton had the second paragraph, but she didn't, she, she would say, read my website, hillaryclinton.co.org, you know, dot whatever it was. And actually, you're never, ever going to convince a crowd by telling them to read your website. This goes back to your... No, but I think the thing that does happen, I think that um, I've done a lot of public speaking. Fortunately, everybody is being very kind tonight, but usually there's somebody yelling at me. Uh, and the question is, um, how do you react? For the most part, you try to avoid it. What was very clever, because I watched Trump on TV... Uh, he loved it when people yelled, and he played off of them. And if you were there, I think you probably felt uh, that you were part of the story. If you watched it on TV, it looked as though he actually was uh, responding to things in the crowd. Mm -hmm. Hillary would get up and give very good speeches. Um, but there was, but this is why I say that I think Trump is clever. He is the epitome of a demagogic leader that knows how to play with what I was talking about earlier, the divisions in society of the haves and have-nots. Do you think that Hillary Clinton spent more time fighting Bernie Sanders than Trump? Actually not, because I think part of the issue, um, and this is kind of talking about family, uh, which is that we did not pay enough attention to Bernie Sanders. That people thought that where, how could he possibly be getting anywhere? So she wasn't taking him seriously I think enough. that, no, I mean, there was this, you know, old because fuddy-duddy man that was... You uh, were, though. I mean, you called out, I know it's a phrase that you then sort of explained, but I, I remember the day you said it, there's a special place in hell for women that don't help each other. And I know you've said it before, but this was a direct, I no, think, at the time. No, I, I need to explain sure. this. I have said that statement forever yeah. uh, because it comes out of my own experience. So the fact, 
since I'm 10 years older than everybody, uh, in terms of everybody. how hard it was to show that I could be getting a graduate degree and have children at the same time, and found that other women were very judgmental about me. And, were, and you know, they'd say, shouldn't you be with your kids? And besides, my hollandaise sauce is better than yours. And, um, and I just kind of felt put down all the time. Mm. So I started that as a statement. It was so popular that it ended up on Starbucks cups. So what happened was we were in New Hampshire, mm. and uh, I started the phrase, I always get wild applause for it. People started applauding, and so they didn't hear what I actually did was to look at Hillary and say, therefore, given what you've done for women, you are going to the other place. It was picked up uh, deliberately in order to make it sound as though I said women had to support her just because she was a woman. I wouldn't vote for Sarah Palin if it was the last person to vote for. <laughs> so, you know. Yeah. But, um, but I, because I remember that very well, I was at the town hall where Hillary Clinton was speaking, and the momentum at the time in New Hampshire, and of course neighbouring Vermont, which was Sanders' home state, was that many of the younger women were going for Bernie. Was that something that you felt shouldn't have happened? Not at, that, not at the time. I have to tell you, we'd, I'd, uh, if I had thought that what I was saying would be interpreted as telling women they had to vote for Hillary, mm. I would not have done that. Mm. I did find interesting, however, um, that I, I, as I said, I campaigned that not all women were for Hillary, and there were older women who were not for her. I think partially because we have this tendency to uh, project our own sense of weakness or guilt. Every woman's middle name is guilt. Uh, you know, we're never in the right place or doing the right thing. And I, I think we couldn't assume that all women would vote for Hillary. And you work very closely with Bill Clinton, of course. And one of the questions we asked ourselves as reporters during that time was whether President Clinton had been more of a help or more of a hindrance to Hillary Clinton's campaign. Well, I think it depended on the, on the time. I think for the most part he was a help. He's one of the most brilliant political people ever. Um, but I think that he got, I, I, it's hard to say, you know. There were many women, as you'll remember, who felt that they didn't want to endorse him because of his behavior during his presidency. Well, I think, you know, there were many women that thought that, but, but I do think in terms of understanding his capability on uh, the issues and all the things that he'd done, but I think uh, it's very hard to judge. I think uh, the truth that we have to remember is actually Hillary Clinton won the popular vote, mm. um, you know, and, and I think that there were a lot of people who liked what she was doing. And modern America today, just before we go to um, the questions, we've come out of the most extraordinary fortnight of seeing children incarcerated, separated from their parents. Um, you've been very careful in your language. I think the phrase Mussolini used was the plucking of a chicken. Uh, that you do it one feather at a time. Is there a danger? That's, by the way, the best quote in the book. Yeah, it's, well, yeah. it's very evocative because yeah. you yeah. understand, importantly, that you never miss one feather. You only notice, perhaps, when the chicken is plucked. Yeah. So at what point, then, do we start to notice the individual feathers and say, this is becoming something that I would now call fascism? Well, I have to tell you, um, everybody, well, the Americans know that there's now this uh, motto all the time, see something, say something. And I have added to that, do something. Uh, and what I'm doing is calling out the feather plucking, which is harder to say. It's harder to say, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> After a glass of wine, it goes a treat, believe me. <laughs> uh, but I do think that that is what has to happen, and to call it out. And, and that is what is on my to-do list. Uh, Anthony Kennedy, overnight, the swing voter on the Supreme Court, has announced he'll be stepping down which means there is a chance now um, for the president to put in place somebody who could cement conservative America in their voting intentions um, for a generation now. Now, conservative America might not be a bad thing if, if 
you know, you believe that that's the way the country is pulling in. Do you have concerns now for what that will look like? I do. I mean, I, but first of all, I, I keep remembering that there was a vacancy on the Supreme Court when President Obama was yeah. in office. And what happened in order to prevent him uh, from being able to put in a different uh, justice on that. Um, and it just kind of, I have to say, how different things would be. Um, and I do think that the timing of this is very complicated. Um, and By that uh, you mean he shouldn't have stepped down now? Or do, yeah. Do, do you, you, you I, I mean, I don't quite understand it. I happen to know Justice Kennedy, and I have worked with him on, we, we did a thing at the UN about property rights, and I think he's a very... Um, thoughtful and smart man. I, I, I don't know why he did it now. I honestly don't. And I do you think, think it's fear? Pardon? Do you think it's fear? Do you well, think he didn't I mean, want to be a part of that anymore? Or? I, I don't know. I have no idea. So what's, what do you envisage now in terms of the balance? Do you think we will see changes to abortion law, to gay rights, to women's rights? What would you envisage now? Well, those are the things that people talk about, you know, that uh, Roe versus Wade and all those very... Um, issues might come up. I think the question will be is, first of all, uh, from apparently President Trump has decided, and there's a list that, um, and I, I'm not familiar enough <coughs> with the people, <coughs> but I think that there will be calls about it. So um, I don't know the answer. Shall we give you a break <coughs> um, whilst I hunt for some hands and some questions? You have a good glug of water. We've got um, a lady here <laughs> and a lady here. <coughs> Thank you very much. Um, don't worry, we're, we're not going to let Secretary Albright go don't, yet. Don't worry, promise. I'm fine. Um, but I'm going to take three. And it wasn't an effort not to answer the question. <laughs> we can come back. Um, is there one more microphone? No, just two. Uh, upstairs. Is there one? Brilliant. Could you hand that to somebody with a hand up? Go on. One of you three. There, fine. If you get over them, and I'm going to start with you. I uh, just want to say good evening, and thank you for your talk. It's really insightful, um, considering your career. I myself am doing my master's in public policy here in London. And um, I just kind of want to ask you this, and I'm sorry if this is just going to be a cluster of words, a two-part question sort of on the topic of the, today's talk, um, fascism. Um, my father himself, he's a refugee from Poland. He left during the um, Soviet Union. And... Um, you mentioned Poland, Hungary, these being these hotbeds for nationalism at the moment in Europe. Would you say in some part that the, even though they are post-USSR um, states, that in some way the sort of traditions of the Soviet Union has helped carry them into this new wave of nationalism? Mm -hmm. And then also on the other side of the Atlantic, would you say that there is a new sort of breed of fascism in the States. Uh, of course, Trump, everyone can roll their eyes, make jokes, but okay. just sort of basic cases. You have nepotism with Derek Kushner, and of course, nepotism is not a <laughs> trait of fascism. It's present everywhere, but sort of really uh, mind-boggling things like the security access uh, in the White House and everything. Great. Would you say there's a yeah. new type well, of fascism? We'll come back yeah. to that. Thank yeah. you very much. Just try and keep them a little bit briefer because then we can yeah. get more hands in. Uh, uh, hello, I'm Manita from Albania. And I wanted to say that the people of Albania and Kosovo really love you. Thank <laughs> <laughs> so you, state for Kosovo. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's your next yeah. one. <laughs> and uh, my question is, do you think the USA still has the same influence in the Balkans as it once did? And if not, do you think that that voice is perhaps going to be filled by Russia? Yeah. Okay, so the same influence in the Balkans. And I think there was one um, hand up here. Yes, sir. Uh, thanks very much for the talk. Um, this one's about... Uh, personal controversy and president. So Donald Trump has considerable and uh, President Clinton had some during his time. Do they act to bring focus onto the person and also the policies or do they distract from policies? No. Are you talking about sex? <laughs> um, yes. Uh, right, okay. So does, so does a personal controversy help to bring yeah. fo policies into focus? Okay. Um, 
Secretary Albright, you can well, start first, where you... Uh, let me just say, I do think um, both very interesting questions about Russian influence in the former, uh, uh, the, the, the zone, frankly. I have spent a lot of time, uh, as I mentioned, I was quite euphoric about the end of the Cold War and trying to figure out what has happened now. Did we make mistakes? Did they make mistakes? I think that part of the issue has been is that democracy and uh, getting it into countries after 50 years of communism is harder than we thought, that um, in many ways we dealt, uh, back to that word, with elites, rather than really understanding what some of the issues were uh, that uh, attracted the people, and that there really has been, because of the facelessness of the European Union, some sense of nationalism. I find the Polish behavior, if there was one person that made a difference in Poland um, and escaping communism, it was the Pope. Uh, mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, the church now in Poland is much more nationalistic uh, and that any number of different complications. And I have spent a lot of time studying all of this, mainly because I've, it's been my major interest, but it's been very hard to figure out what it's about. I'll get to your second question, but first, uh, I, I do think that uh, you know, there are many, many accidents of history, and the fact that um, I am actually that I spent time in Yugoslavia, that I understand Serbian, um, and it's a part of the world that I can identify with in many ways, and the horrors that were going on there in terms of ethnic cleansing that reminded a lot of people of what had happened during World War II meant that the Clinton administration, we spent a lot of time. I think that. Uh, there was not enough attention continued to be paid to what was going on there. And I think the Russians see it as part of their zone of influence. And so that there is a lot of interaction there now. And there are questions, again, as to how the, whether the European Union is going to take more countries in. What has been very interesting in the last few days, an argument that has gone on about the name of Macedonia uh, has been, I think, um, I guess, fixed by calling the, what we used to call Macedonia Firam. When I was at the UN, I was trying to figure out if some Martian came in, that when they'd figure out what Firam was. Um, <laughs> but I think there is some hope that that will allow some more entry into the EU, and yet there are questions about how the EU works. So, Do you um, think that Donald Trump would come in to um, save the Balkans? if the same situation was I'd be very surprised, uh, uh, because the question is, what happened was we knew that at the UN there'd be a veto by the Russians, and so we went to NATO to do things. Uh, there also was a uh, more concerted effort to figure out what was happening on ethnic cleansing. I think the real question is, uh, at the basis of this, and some even to go back to your answer, is. President Trump sees a different role for America. Mm. And what he has done, I happen to believe, and everybody has their background, is that the influence of the United States and our power makes a difference in helping. Why wouldn't I? Everything changed when the Yankees came to, and when I was here during the Blitz. So, uh, you know, I have my history, and I do think that we should be able to do something. What President Trump has changed is he sees America as a victim and mm. as us paying for everything. And so Angela Merkel actually said that she wasn't sure we could rely, um, they, the Europeans could rely on America. So I'd be surprised, frankly. And, and I think that that aspect of understanding what the Russians are doing, which I mentioned of trying to separate us from everybody, our democratic friends, is part of the problem. I do think there are tendencies in terms of um, the glorification of a single person and um, a bit of nepotism and stuff going on. So I am concerned about a variety of behavioral aspects. On the last question, I think that, um, I, I do think, I happen to know the following thing, I, that um, I obviously believe that President Clinton shouldn't have done what he did but he had a tendency to compartmentalize, and we did more foreign policy in 1998 than, than most times. Uh, I think that 
they're really, uh, but I, I think, and I find this a hard question to answer because I think there's much more in terms of um, character and morality um, than, um, than just, uh, I'm concerned about, and it goes to your point, uh, really what does President Trump really think his job is? Okay, let's get three more questions if we can. There's a lady at the back with her hand up. No, you're looking round now, it's you. <laughs> Thank you, lovely. Um, there's a gentleman there with his hand in the spotlight. And, uh, and yes, very straight hand. Uh, oh, 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 yes, I'm gonna get the lady just behind you because I saw her first. I'll come back to you afterwards. Thanks. Why don't we start up the top, for fairness? Hi, thank you very much for your time. Um, I wanted to ask you if there were a couple of issues that you would want to highlight um, that perhaps these days uh, we've just become too used to and maybe our eyes have just glazed over. Uh, for example, I visited Berlin not so long ago for the first time and it's quite shocking when you see just how over the course of many years the wall got fortified and you wonder how is it that people didn't do anything about it or were just not as shocked as you might be many years later reading about it. So what is it that you've seen over the world um, that has shocked you the most? Great. Okay. What is it you've seen over the, uh, around the world that shocked you the most or revisited place that have shocked you the most? Yeah. Um, sir, you've got a mic there. Yep. Hi, Secretary Albert. Oh, hi, Secretary. Um, I'm a master's student at the LSE doing my master's in international relations. So this has been a great talk. Um, I wanted to ask you for, you know, a couple years from now, next administration, fingers crossed. Um, in terms of, we talked a little bit about, um, you know, the role of the U.S. in the world and seeding geopolitical ground in Europe especially and driving that wedge between the U.S. and our, our NATO allies and NATO partners. For the next administration on cleanup duty, um, what are a couple of things that you think that they should focus on in terms of, you know, reestablishing ties and kind of fixing some of the issues that have come to light in, in the past couple of years. Thank you. So yeah. next administration, uh, you, you're assuming, will be a Democrat administration? Or, I mean, not necessarily. Yeah, they, okay, yeah, yeah. okay. Um, so the cleanup operation there, what yeah. should they put first? And, 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 and where was my other hand? Thank you, hand. Mm -hmm. Um, the Syrian war is uh, increasingly discussed as an immigration issue in the West. Do you think that um, the UK, America, the West will understand the Middle East? Is there hope for peace um, in the Middle East? Or has Russia um, increasing its influence too much to prevent uh, a solution, particularly in Syria? Great, thank you. So we've got three questions there. Hope for peace in the Middle East... Um, the Cleanup Act and what should be the priority of, of whatever administration comes next. And this question about what has shocked you going around the world. Well, um, in, that, in the order, um, what has shocked me the most? Unfortunately, there were too many things that shocked me. Um, I have to say that when um, I was in, um, in the Balkans, when I was UN ambassador, and walked through fields where bones were sticking up, uh, and people had been buried, and some of the people said, well, that was from World War II. It wasn't. Mm -hmm. And going uh, to um, see that, and then uh, being in Rwanda, where uh, we should have been, and uh, going and seeing um, there was a church there that looked like something in Switzerland, which in fact had been a place that people ran to, um, and there was blood all over the church, and then I went to a stadium where they had herded everybody in and cut their Achilles tendons so that they couldn't leave and blood all over. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, very and terrible things that I never thought that I would see or have to do. And then something that I never thought I would have to do when our embassies in Kenya and Tanzania were blown up and I had to go there to get the bodies and to be in an airplane surrounded by American coffins with flags on them and have to explain to the families what happened. So a lot of different things that I never thought I would have to deal with. The wall, it's interesting you mention it because it's just the anniversary of uh, the Berlin airlift. And, uh, and I think that the shock of that and, and what it did really, it was so visibly concrete that it, it was something that couldn't be missed, whereas a lot of the things that we see now are kind of creeping things that um, uh, show the problems. You know, there's nothing more visible 
or wrong than a wall. So the, um, the second couple of questions, uh, hope in, for peace in the Middle East. Um, gosh, that's going to be a, a tight one, isn't it? Um, and the clean-up. Uh, if that's how you see it, of whoever comes next. Well, let me do the Middle East thing, because one of the things that we spent in the Clinton administration a lot of time on the Middle East, I actually worked for a president who read a lot, and he assigned books to us. And one that President Clinton assigned to me was called The Peace to End All Peace by David Fromkin, who described the creation of the modern Middle East after World War I. The short version of the book... Uh, is that the modern Middle East was created by the British and French bureaucracies lying to each other. Mm. And so there are artificial countries and a variety of things that happen. And the history has been complex all along. I do think that, and I've just done a task force on the Middle East in terms of understanding the depths of of the crisis that's gone on there. Uh, I happen to think the war in Iraq was one of the biggest mistakes in American foreign policy and then what has been happening with the spread of it to Syria, and that the refugee crisis really comes out of that. There is less attention to the Middle East peace process itself, interestingly Mm -hmm. enough, and there is the question also of what the Russians are doing in the Middle East and exerting their influence. Um, We were talking about the Balkans, but they also are exerting their influence in the Middle East. So I see a lot of danger and trouble, and again, the question as to whether President Trump is going to be involved in places. I think that is genuinely the question, which leads to the third question. I think that it, the, the role of the United States, first of all, Americans are not a colonial power and don't like to run the world. But I think that if we withdraw completely uh, and see ourselves as victims and think that, that people have to pay us to be part of alliances, is I think it undermines the system. So I am hoping that people will understand. I've been saying that when you're 70, whether you're an institution or a person, you need a little refurbishing. And so there needs to be work on our institutional structures. The United States needs to be a part of it as a partner. Americans don't like the word multilateralism. It has too many syllables and it ends in an ism. But it is just (laughs) partnerships. And so I hope that there will be a a re... For America, it is the job of the President, the Secretary of State, and Secretary of Defense to worry about the national interests of our country. Mm -hmm. But I see our national interests fulfilled best when we have strong allies, when we don't allow uh, ethnic cleansing to happen somewhere. Just on that note, though, just to say he has pulled out is perhaps not to... um, give him his due in ISIS, with ISIS in Syria, uh, in Iraq. I mean, that has been at the front of his foreign policy, and to some great extent, it seems to have worked, doesn't it? Well, I think that the question is, um, to what extent does it lead... I'm not saying that the work there has to be military. I do think that one of the things that needs to be paid attention to is what happens to... Um, societies after something like that? How do you make sure that there is a rebuilding? And and one issue leads to another. I am a refugee, but I happen to believe that people want to live in the country where they were born, if they can actually live there, because they have language and family and make a living. And so what the United States and the um, richer country need to do is to help rebuild these countries so that they are not petri dishes for people who hate us. So, um, there, you know, we may not have to have troops someplace, but we can't give up attention and uh, all of a sudden see others taking over. So. And on that last note, I think you've, you've sort of um, pulled it together, but it, what would you say should be the priorities? Is it about, are you talking about looking out onto the world or is there something? Domestically, the Both. They go together. By the way, I have uh, been a foreign policy advisor in many campaigns, and nobody paid attention, so in order to make myself more important, I'd say domestic and foreign policy go together. They actually do. 
And we can see that in terms of some of the trade issues, in terms of the immigration issues, and there's some subjects that affect all of us, like global warming, uh, climate change, that actually needs international cooperation. So I, do, I think that domestic and foreign policy go together, and America's national interests are best taken care of if other people are not dying or have Ebola or any number, or we're not frying um, from uh, climate change. Yeah. I'm going to take one last question. This is impossible. Your hand was first, so I'll go to you. No pressure, but make sure it's really, really good. <laughs> uh, good evening, Madam Secretary. You mentioned at the beginning of your talk um, that you felt that there'd been a breakdown of the social contract and also that President Trump rose to power in part because um, of white males who had lost their jobs because of technology. Um, what do you think, if any, is the link between technology and fascism? Where is that going and what might we do about that? Gosh, interesting. Yeah, no. a link between technology and fascism. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I do think that one of the things, uh, if one looks at things historically, there have been changes, the Industrial Revolution, and they always create a certain amount of disruption. Um, I think that um, we can't operate without the new technology, but we have not adapted it enough or adapted our people enough to be able to deal with it, and there really have been a loss of jobs as a result of it. I hope that we see technology as something serving the people um, so that um, our educational systems can be ones where people really are able to get one step ahead of it and uh, be able not to be run by uh, artificial intelligence, but to really have a role in its evolution. Where technology and fascism go together is the fact that it, people are out of jobs as a result of it, but another aspect which is that a um, authoritarian person that hasn't an interest in democracy and democratic institutions and the freedom of the press is able to use technology uh, in order mm -hmm. to get out a false message. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm speaking of Putin. Uh, I really do think that the weaponization of information is something that we have to be careful about. Um, and, a, and in many ways, technology is kind of, um, it, it's a tool that can be, uh, one way to always end things is to uh, quote Nelson Mandela or Archbishop Tutu, and they said, a knife can be either used to cut bread or stick in somebody's mm -hmm. back. And so I think that we need to see technology as something that represents the the values of a society and the way that it is used. It can be used for good and it can be perverted by somebody who only thinks of his own power. And one of the things, to go back to Mussolini and Hitler, they were convinced that they were infallible, that they were the smartest people there, that they had the answers for everything. And if somebody like that uses technology, then it really does fit with the steps of plucking the feathers. Uh, so that's you, you've earned your wine. <laughs> <laughs> um, just to say that Secretary Albright will be signing uh, copies of her book upstairs, and there will be copies available uh, as you leave by the door. But uh, it's been an enormous pleasure yeah. and an honour to thank have you, you here this evening. Thank you all so much. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you.